Hi everyone, how are you today? Today, welcome to my show, to my show and to my program as the Cheese Doctor. Today we have the program number four. And uh, well, we've been a while since we started and we're trying to make this program now in English, the English version. I don't expect to come many people, but anyway, the idea is if you can, because uh, many people are on the planet at this time, it's very complicated because it's at night over there or maybe it's early in the morning. And you can, I know, I understand you guys can assist, but it's the only time that I can make the show. And <clears throat> um, today we're going to speak about the cheese, the, the, the starter cultures that we need to make cheese. And um, it's very important when we make cheese, we have the right bacteria and I'm going to speak about it. What type of bacteria can you use? Um, we have two types of bacteria, one that reproduce at low temperatures and other ones that reproduce at high temperatures. I want to speak about it. What type of bacteria do we have? <clears throat> anyway, we're going to speak about it. And also, I'm going to answer questions of the audience. I have a lot of questions here that I'm going to answer. We are um, the show is going live now in Facebook, in Instagram, and YouTube. I had problems in my last show that, that uh, two hours ago. I had problem with the um, with the platform with Facebook and Instagram. I don't know what happened, but I couldn't I couldn't see the um, people from Facebook and Instagram couldn't see me couldn't, couldn't watch me. And <clears throat> okay, let's start. If you guys have any comments, if you want to comment, you're more than welcome. You're gonna, if you want to ask questions, you're more than welcome. This, this the idea is that you you guys can answer all your questions here. And this place, I want I want it to be like a um, fountain of knowledge for everyone that wants to make cheese. This is free to attend, and I'm very happy that you guys are here in my, in my show. Okay, so let's start about the. Um, Cheese starters and the starter cultures to make cheese. And I'm gonna share the screen with you and make the press put the on put on the presentation. <clears throat> okay. It's a PowerPoint presentation. I hope you like it. Uh, I don't have it here. <laughs> Let me find it. I know it's here. Yeah, it is. Okie dokie. Let me start here. Okay. <clears throat> always have this problem with the platform the first oh here it is okay today is our program number four and today we're going to speak about starter cultures for uh, that we need to use how to make cheese okay i've been speaking in all in older programs that about the milk <clears throat> we have to use and i have give i have to touch you guys the content of the milk we have in milk we have lactose we have um, fat we have proteins and we have bacterias that are into the milk however these bacteria sometimes are good bacteria and bad bacteria the good bacteria is the one that we use to make cheese these are called lactic acid bacteria because they get fit from back they get their food from the lactose which is the sugar on the milk and they produce an acid called lactic acid. This, this acid lowered the pH, made the cheese or made the milk more acid, more acidic. Therefore, it will make the cheese more acidic. However, when we, um, as I said, we have good bacteria and bad bacteria, and we have to kill the good bacteria, the, the bad bacteria. So what we use to kill the bacteria, we, we use a process called pasteurization. Pasteurization kills the bacteria, but also kill the, the, the pathogens bacteria. They call it pathogens. However, pasteurization also kills the good bacteria. So it kills everything, the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. And we have to put this bacteria back again into the milk. So this type of bacteria, we call it in this, in the cheese making environment, we call it starter cultures. Okay, and what they do, 
these are live organisms that are we bought it in the places where where uh, where you guys buy stuff to make cheese i have it on my website drquesero.com or cheesedoctor.com you can find it there but anyway <clears throat> this as this bacteria they come in a powder form okay and they are dormant because they are kept in a freezer they have to keep it we have to keep it in a very low at very low temperature we're talking about minus four minus six even minus more more than that um so the idea is to keep it really um in a very cold environment and these bacteria as i said they are sleeping in their package what do they do they once they get awake, awoken they get their food from lactose from the milk and they start to produce acid but they also produce gas and produce flavor depending on the type of bacteria some of them produce as uh, produce gas some of them produce acid some of them produce flavor and some of them produce all of them so is the ability of the cheese maker how to combine them of course there are recipes that, that tells you what type of bacteria you have to use for each type of cheese for example, if you want to make mozzarella, you have to use a bacteria that produces only acid. If you want to make cheddar, <coughs> you have to use a bacteria that produces acid and produce also um, flavor. So that's the ability of the cheese maker. If you're going to if you're going to make camembert cheese, you have to produce you have to use a bacteria that produces a little bit of gas. Uh, sorry a little bit of flavor and you also have to combine not only bacteria you have to combine with fungus or molds that they will cover the cheese eventually so this is the ability of the bacteria so how to choose the bacteria there are two types of bacteria in cheese making is one bacteria called mesophilic bacteria and the other one is called thermophilic bacteria the mesophilic bacteria is bacteria that live in low temperature in a low temperature environment let's say from 15 degrees to 40 degrees celsius they live in this range however their best temperature i mean the best temperature to, um, where they reproduce a lot and this is the the best environment for them is between 29 degrees and uh, 29 from 29 to 35 degrees in this ranch, the bacteria is very happy, is reproducing very well. This is the ideal temperature. However, if you have 31, 32, 33, and because you made a mistake or you let you or, or you left the, the, the milk heating and you forgot about it and it passed this temperature, don't worry about it. As long as it is not between um, lower than 15 or above 40, you're gonna be okay. Okay, so this is a ranch. So um, <clears throat> this type of mesophilic culture, we have in this in the mesophilic culture, we have chains of bacteria. So we can have um, one bacteria, two bacteria, or three bacteria, and they all and this bacteria can also produce acid, or can produce, or can have more than one um, work to do. For example. One back, if we say that the bacteria only produce acid, we call we, we call these bacteria homo fermentative, homo fermentative bacteria. Now, if the bacteria produce acid and something else, for example, gas or flavor, we call these bacteria heterofermentative. Okay, so um, for cheese making, you don't you don't need to know that. If you're making cheese at home, you don't need to you, you don't need to know that. But anyway, I'm just telling you because it's important to learn. So, as I said, these mesophilic bacteria are bacteria that like low temperatures. Now, but you have we, we have also another type of bacteria called thermophilic bacteria or thermophilic cultures. These bacteria like high temperatures, and they live between 35 and 55 celsius in this ranch they are very happy they are living normally they die at 
fifth, after 55 degrees. So if you're heating your milk, and for a reason, you're using thermophilic culture, and you left it too long into the water, sorry, into, a, into the stove, heating the, heating the, the milk, and it reached it reach 56, 57, 58 degrees, now you know that you kill the bacteria, you have to inoculate the milk again. The same happened with the methophilic one. If you are using mesophilic cultures and you heat it for, any, for a reason, you heat the milk above 40, this bacteria is going to die. You have to inoculate the milk again. However, if you are heating below 50, in, mes, in, 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 in case of the mesophilic bacteria, if you're heating below 15 or, be, or, or the thermophilic one, you're below 35, it doesn't mean that you're killing the bacteria. The bacteria, um, the thing is that the, below this temperature, the bacteria fall asleep again and, does, and it doesn't produce lactic acid. So what you need to do is raise the temperature and you will awaken again the bacteria and they, start, they will start to produce lactic acid, okay? So, and this is more or less what you need to know when you are making cheese. Now, how do we name, what does it name? Um, the bacteria have a, a, a way to name it, depending on the family of the bacteria, the species of the bacteria, and the subspecies, and also the strain. For example, if we have a bacteria, when we name, when, when we name a bacteria, we always have to put first the family. Secondly, we have to put the species, thirdly, the subspecies and so on. So when we name a bacteria, there is, for example, we have this type of families, which is Lactococcus, is a bacteria that produces acid. We have also Streptococcus, they also produce acid. Lactobacillus also produce acid. We have Leuconoscot, they produce flavor and texture. And the last one, which is not a lactic bacteria, is um, is a bacteria, but it's not lactic. Okay, they produce flavor and they produce gas as well. When we when I put texture here, it's because they produce gas. They change the texture of the cheese. So, in the example, I can use any type of families that I, I have here. So, in this case, I used Lactococcus. And the family of the, the, the subspecies is Lactis. And the subspecies is Cremoris. And so on. And the strain. Okay? So, um, we have, depending of the name that we, we, uh, that we use, is according to, according to the way we have to name it. What I'm trying to tell you is, you don't need to learn this. Um, but it's good to know when we make cheese, it's important that you know what type of bacteria are you using. And I'm gonna tell you in the next in the next screen. Um, this is just the way to name it. The name is already into the market. So when you see the, what I want you to to know is when you see the, this name, don't get scared. Just watch it, and you know, you will know if it is a mesophilic one or a thermophilic one because I'm gonna tell you. Okay, which one is mesophilic and which one is thermophilic? This is what we need to know. When we make cheese, we need to know which bacteria is thermophilic and which bacteria is thermophilic. Which one produces acid, which one produces gas, or which one produces flavor? I'm gonna tell you in a couple of minutes, okay? So, when we make cheese, uh, okay, I made a problem here, I have a mistake here, it's number four. Anyway, this type of starters, we can call it that they are single strains or multi strains. When we say that a starter is single strain, it's because we have only one type of bacteria. Let's say Lactococcus lactis, let's see, or Lactococcus cremoris. This is one type of bacteria. But sometimes this bacteria comes in couples or maybe in, in three of them, a chain of three, three of them. The, uh, this type of this type of man of um, the, the the companies that manufacture the lactic bacteria sometimes they combine one two or three together 
to avoid something that is called bacteriophage. And I'm going to explain to you later what it is. Okay? So when we say that a starter culture is a single strain, it's because there is only one bacteria. If we say, if we, if, if we, when we read, when we read this instruction of the, of the package, that this is a multiple strain starter culture, is because you have more than one bacteria, which is good. This is normally, this is what we, what we buy, um, chains or two or more bacteria to avoid bacterial fire. Okay, so put this in mind. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you the name of the bacteria, the, the most common names of the bacteria that we use in cheese making, so you know which one is which. So we have Lactococcus. This is the most, the most common one, the, the first two. And these two are called mesophilic starter cultures, both of them. When, when normally when we speak about, hey, I'm going to buy a mesophilic culture, we're talking about these two these two types of bacteria. Their name is Lactococcus lactic. Lactococcus is the family. Lactic is the, um, the species. And the subspecies is lactis. It's Lactococcus lactis lactis. Okay? It's a methophilic bacteria. And the optimal temperature that they that they have the, 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 uh, is between 29 and 35 degrees. I told you it was it was between 15 and 40. They live in this range, but the best temperature to reproduce is between 29 and 35. So from now on, I'm gonna tell you the best temperature that they, this bacteria that this bacteria need to reproduce accordingly. So this lactococcus lactis of lactis, the, their main function is to produce acid. So if you want to have, if you want to make, for example, yogurt you can use this bacteria because it only produces acid. And yogurt is only acid. You acidify the milk and this acid production will coagulate the, the milk and will produce and will make the, the yogurt. But you can make also cheese with this, with this type of, uh, of, of bacteria. Now, um, if you're gonna use, an, if you want to use another type of, like uh, another type of starter culture, for example, for yogurt would be the, the um, Lactococcus acidophilus. You can use either one of them. Now you have to answer, you have to manage price. If one is cheaper than the other one, use the cheapest, use the cheapest one. But if you wanna make cheese, you have to use um, Lactococcus acid, Lactococcus lactis, if you are using, if you want, if you're looking for acid production. Another one that you use together as well is Lactococcus lactic cremoris. They are also mesophilic. The range is between 29 and 32. So if you, <coughs> as a cheesemaker, for example, you want, um, you, when you buy the, the, the mesophilic culture and they come in strains and they come with these two types of, of bacteria from, and uh, they come with, Lactococcus lactis and cremoris. They use the uh, the strain has both. You have to heat your milk in the common range of these two bacteria. Let's say 30, 30 degrees or thirty one degrees or thirty two degrees, because thirty two is here, but it's also here. So you will have both bacteria producing acid. But if you want, um, let's say, um, if you want. Um, to reduce the acid production, maybe you can heat at 34 degrees, which means that this bacteria will produce acid. But this bacteria, which, because the, the, the range is between 29 and 32, maybe the acid production of this bacteria is not going to be so high because it's not in the in the um, between this range. So you can play with this, okay. And this is the ability of you of, 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 uh, as a cheesemaker. Okay, remember that cheese making is science, but it's also art. And the way we combine the science is when we make art. So um, another bacteria that we that we use as well is Lactococcus. It's another family. Instead of I'm oh, no, sorry, it's the same family. Lactococcus lactis, sublactis, viovarius acylactis. This is the chain. Okay, family. 
species, subspecies, and strain. Okay, the strain is the Acesilactis, the Biobarres Acesilactis. So, um, this type of bacteria is also mesophilic. The temperature, the, oct the optimal temperature is 35 degrees. It's between 29 and 35 as well. And also produce acid, but also produce flavor and gas. They produce the three of them. So if you want to make a cheese with holes and stuff, you can use this type of bacteria. Another, fa ah, sorry. Let me go back again. Ah. Uh. So another, another bacteria is the another family is the leuconoscope. This is another family. Mesenteroides. Subspecies cremoris. They are also mesophilic and their temperature is between 29 and 34 degrees Celsius. So when you go to the um, cheese store or the, to the um, website if you're going to buy it online um, and you want to use this type of bacteria, the package will tell you this package, this bacteria, this, this package contains this type of bacteria, Leuconoscus mesenteroides, suspicious cremoris. Okay? It's a mesophilic one as well. And we have another one, Streptococcus. The, the first four that I gave you, uh, all of them are mesophilic ones. So they like, as I said, low temperatures. But now we have the thermophilic ones, which is the next four that I'm telling you. All of them are thermophilic, thermophilic starter cultures, and they like high temperatures. So, Streptococcus thermophilus is the most common one that we use. We use this type of bacteria to make mozzarella, okay, provolone, all pasta filata cheeses, all or string cheeses. Um, their their temperature, the best temperature for the for reproduction is between 40 and 45 degrees Celsius. And as I said, they only produce acid. They don't produce flavor. So you want to make mozzarella, which is a cheese that need to have a certain level of acidity, use this type of bacteria because this is the co most common bacteria that you, that you want to need to make this type of cheese. Um, another one is the Lactibacillus delbrecki sub bulgaricus. The family is Lactobacillus. The Delbrecki is the family and the species, sorry. And the subspecies is Bulgaricus. They also produce acid and they like the same level, the same range of temperature between 45 and 48. This is the one, this range is a little bit bigger. But however, they both produce acid. We have also the Lactibacillus helveticus, which is another thermophilic culture. This is the range of temperature between 45 and 48 degrees, and they produce acid as well. And the last one, um, Lactibacillus lactis, okay, they produce, they are thermophilic one, and their best temperatures are for approximately 45 degrees, and also produce acid. So, when you buy, when you go to the stores and buy your culture, your starter cultures, you will have, or you will notice that these cultures come in strains, in combination of one or two bacteria. Normally, or usually, this type of bacteria comes, for example, Streptococcus thermophilus and Lactococcus lactis. They all usually come together, okay? But it doesn't mean that if you find the other two, it means that it's wrong. No, it's not wrong. The thing is that you have to know the level, the, the right temperature to, for them to reproduce accordingly. So you have to um, be careful with that. Don't heat the milk. Don't use static cultures and heat below this range that I told you before between the um, 29, let me tell you, uh, some of the ones. Um, let me go back. Here. Don't use thermophilic bacteria and heat below or or between below 35 because the bacteria is not going to reproduce and you're not going to have acid production so you have if you're using a sad culture you have to heat the milk 
in the ranch that the bacteria reproduce. This is very important that you need to know, and you need to know that, okay? Um, sometimes I have, have questions about people that tell, ask me, Dietrich, uh, I heated the milk and I heat it according to the recipe, but I heat it at um, 20 degrees. Uh -huh. what back and I'm asking, what type of bacteria are you are you are you using? No, I, I um, the recipe says thermophilic, but I use another, this one that I found, or I, I use yogurt, and yogurt is an acidophilus, and it's a methophilic one, and that's the reason that why the milk doesn't get acid, or the curd doesn't get acidic, because you the this person is heating below the range of the reproduction of the, of the bacteria, so this need to be taken in account when you guys are making cheese, okay? Um, let me see, let's go back to the... Okay. Okay, this is what I wanted to tell you about the um, lactic acid cultures, um, because we're gonna answer some questions. Um, for the next program, I'm gonna tell you about the problems that we might have when we are making cheese. One of them, the milk doesn't get acidic. Why? Maybe you have, ah, I didn't, I didn't speak about bacteriophage. I told you that I was gonna speak about it. Let me see if I can find them. Oh, let's, let, let's leave it for the, for the next class, okay? About bacteriophage, but anyway, I'm gonna tell you what it is. Bacteriophage is, um, let me finish here. Let me stop sharing the screen. Okay. Okay, as I said, bacteriophage is an invasion of, uh, of a virus or type of any, uh, several types of virus. They invade the milk, this virus invade the milk and attack the lactic bacteria and eventually they kill them. The, uh, how they act, I'm going to tell you in the next class, but this is the bacteriophage um, process. The bacteria, the, this virus kills the, lactic, uh, kills the lactic bacteria, or the starter culture, they kill them, and therefore the bacteria doesn't produce acid. And you're going to notice in your milk that after one hour, two hours, the pH doesn't, doesn't lower or doesn't get low. And you, you will notice something is happening. Maybe you might be you might be a victim of starter of a bacteriophage. Okay, so um, but I'm going to explain you that in the next class. Okay, now let's answer some questions. Um, let me see if I can find. I have here a question. Let me get rid of this first. Okay, I have Melanie. Melanie tells telling me. Can you brine cheese that has been aged for a month? My cheese is 30 days and it's a bit bland. It's a bit bland, which I believe is because I didn't put enough salt. Can I pop in for an hour into a brine and see it will help or it is too late? No, Melanie, you can, you can use brine. I mean, remember when we when um, when we put cheese in brine, there is a phenomenon called osmosis. Osmosis is the um, the pass of a liquid from a lower concentration, sorry, sorry, so a higher concentration to a lower concentration. Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, or vice versa, okay? So, because your cheese has a lower concentration, okay? If you put it in brine, the high content of salt will be tend to uh, be absorbed by the cheese. Now, you're saying that only one hour. It will depend of the size of the cheese that you, uh, that you have into the brine, but for sure, and definitely, of you, you do can put your cheese into brine, depending of the block of the cheese. Leave it for a while, 
and the cheese will get the salt from the brine. Okay, so don't worry about it. You can do that. Now, how long do you can you put the cheese into the brine? This the, there is a criteria that we use, and it's a form like a, like a small formula. So, your cheese you have to weigh it in pounds, multiply by the height in inches. Let's put an example. If your cheese that is blind is four pounds and the height is three inches, multiply four times three. So you have to leave your cheese 12 hours. Okay? Four times three is 12. You have to leave your cheese 12 hours, depending on the size of the cheese. Um, if you're talking about just a small wedge, of cheese, all right. Now you have to do it by by eye, more or less. Weight it, and if you see, for example, if it is a this wedge of this wedge is a quarter of the cheese, multiply by divide by four because it's, it's a quarter. The wedge is a quarter, depending on the size of the cheese. Okay, and you can have more or less a criteria how to measure the and how to get the level. Of salt of, of your cheese okay so uh, i hope i have answered your questions let's go to the second questions uh, hi i'm looking to make a simple blue cheese but the only mold that i have are square feta molds and <coughs> one is part of the math milli press none that i have open-ended would it be okay? Look, uh, whose name? I don't know the name. Anyway, the mold is just to give the the form of the of the container that contain is containing the curd. You can use square molds. You can use round molds. Doesn't matter. I have I have seen cheeses with uh, the, with the form of the heart. So it doesn't matter. You can use Feta mold, that is very important. If you're going to make blue cheese, you have to um, follow the follow the, the recipe to make the, feta, the, um, the blue cheese, which is put into the mold, turn it over, I mean, follow the recipe, and then you have to because inoculate the milk with the bacteria or with the fungus. And after that, you have to, um, you have to, Pierce the cheese eventually after one or two weeks. You have to follow the recipe. Um, Manal, hi Manal, how are you? Nice meeting you. Nice to see having you here in my show. I know that over there is very, very late. But anyway, this is what I can do. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm starting. Um, if you want to, we can live together to see what is the best time for you to attend. And so you, um, we can have people from your country as well, more people. Um, okay, um, let's go with another question. Uh, does anyone know if you were able to fly with cheese? Oh, what a question. <laughs> I'm heading to a buddy's house in a couple of weeks in the States, and we have a type of cheese that he can't get where he lives. I was going to bring him five pounds of block to him. Well, look, um, it will depend on the type of cheese that you are delivering or transporting. Forget about fresh cheeses. You can bring to America fresh cheeses because it's forbidden. Unless you have all the permits and all your documentation, which I believe you don't. So, if you can take with you into the plane, uh, um, Aged cheeses, after, but this age, this aging has to be above two months. So if the cheese is right, it's been aging for one month, forget about it. This is considered fresh cheese. You can take it to America. But if you have, for example, pecorino, or you have um, any cheese that has been aging for more than two months, you can transport, you can take it to America with you into the plane you won't have any problem try to vacuum pack it first vacuum pack it 
Um, if if you bought it, if you bought it and it's not vacuum packed, please vacuum pack it. Vacuum pack it and put it into the into your luggage. You're not you're not gonna have any problem. Okay. So um, yeah. Let's see. Manal have a question. Some beginners. Let me see. Some beginners. Some beginners cheese say all kind cheese have the same taste. Is it right? And how can I avoid that? I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> Let me see if I could if I understood your question. Some beginners, some beginners cheese makers, I would say. All kind cheese have the same taste. Is it right? No. No. How can I avoid? Can you? Make the question in a different way that I can that I can understand. I'm understanding, Manel, that all the cheeses are have the same taste. Some beginner cheese say all kind of cheese have the same taste. Is it right? How can I avoid that? Look. Anyway, what I can understand from your question is. Not all the cheeses have the same the same flavor. They don't they don't the same taste. They don't have the same flavor. They have different flavor depending on the bacteria that they use it. What happening what's happening is when you when you make cheese, if you make cheese with raw milk, this bacteria this the, the bacteria that is in the raw milk, especially if you as I said you use raw milk, all the bacteria is into the milk. Therefore, this bacteria will produce a lot of enzymes and also the bacteria, also the, the, the milk have just, we call it um, native just, they, they are into the milk. This bacteria will, and the, this just will produce, especially the bacteria, they will produce enzymes. These enzymes will change the texture and also will change the flavor of the cheese, okay? So um, if you don't put the bacteria, or if you pasteurize the milk, but you don't put the bacteria, this bacteria eventually, because you don't have any bacteria into the milk, they will not produce these enzymes. Therefore, your cheese is gonna be very bland, very mild. It's not gonna have any flavor. For example, when we, when we make paneer, Paneer is a cheese that doesn't have any bacteria on it because you use pasteurized milk acidified with lemon or with vinegar, and you don't have any reproduction of the, any other bacteria. Therefore, your cheese is not going to have much flavor. But if you make, for example, feta feta cheese, and you when you make feta, you have to inoculate the milk with starter cultures, so you, your bacteria will produce acid, but also enzymes. And this bacteria will lower the pH at 4.6, which is the pH to make feta. During this process, the bacteria produce also enzymes. When you make the feta, your feta is gonna have a lot of flavor because this enzyme help you to improve the flavor of the feta cheese. So um, how to avoid it? No. Um, you, you can you if you use lactic cultures or starter cultures, you're gonna have flavor. If you don't use them, you don't you, you're not gonna have any flavor in your cheese. Your cheese is gonna be very bland, very plain. Okay, I hope I have I have answered your question. Alex, hi Alex, how are you? Nice coming, nice to see you. Nice to have you here in my in my in my show. Okay, um, if you can if you guys can tell me your country where you're coming from. I'm very happy to, to know. Okay, uh, let me go with another question. Um, uh, okay. Hi. Oh, a quick question. Can you reuse your brand solution or is best to make a new, a new one every time it's needed? Very good question. I forgot to write the names, but anyway, <laughs> I'm gonna answer the questions and wait. This is a very good question. 
Usually when you make, when you want to make cheese, you're salting with brine, which is a salt solution, basically. What percentage of this solution is advisable to make cheese? 20%, 20% solution, which means how to make this type of brine. I'm gonna kill two birds with one shot. I'm gonna teach you how to, how to prepare the brine and I'm gonna teach you what to do with the brine. So to answer the question, of course, yes, you can use this brine each time that you're making cheese. You don't have to dump it. You don't have to throw it, throw it away. The main thing that you have to do is when you use it after two or three times, this brine solution has to have a pH of 5.0. So if for any reason your brine lower the pH, you have to put a salt to raise the pH or vice versa. If your pH is too high, you have to put a little bit of acid, vinegar mostly, to lower the pH. So you have to bring your pH between 5.0. Why this pH? Because no, usually this pH of the brine is more or less the pH of the cheese. So by osmosis, if your pH of the brine is too high, it will, this, this um, alkalinity, alkalinity is going to pass to the cheese. So generally, you, the level of pH should be 5.0. So this is one way, one thing that you have to, to preserve it. Another thing that sometimes when you make cheese, this brine get contaminated with spores, um, Streptococcus aureus, um, Penicillium, as, Aspergillus, I mean, molds that are on the air, they're floating on the air. So once in a while, maybe if you're using the, the brine every day, maybe once in a while, I would say once a week, boil, you have to boil the brine. When you boil the brine, you, you're gonna kill all the bacteria and filter it. Once you do that, you can reuse it again. Normally in the cheese plants, this is the process that what they do. They monitor the pH and also they boil or heat the, the brine after several uses, uses uh, after several times, I don't know. Um, it depending of the, of, the, um, of the criteria as a cheese maker. I would say once a week is right. Um, I use brine a lot, a lot, so I boil it and keep it at the right at the right temperature. However, sometimes I use so much um, a very small amount, I just dump it, make a new one. Doesn't matter. It depends on the, on the type of cheese and the amount of brine that you use. If you're using a lot of brine, for example, I would say 300 liters of brine because you're putting inside maybe. 50, 60 small cheeses, remember, for example, you can um, heat the brine or pasteurize it as well um, to preserve it and use it and use it and use it many times. Of course, you also um, have to check the level of salt because some, um, and you have to measure the concentration, maybe some tests, I don't know, but you can reuse it many times, okay? Let me go with uh, <clears throat> Well, hi, I have this question. What, um, do you, what is the survivable temperature range of penicillin candidum? In example, roughly, what is the highest temperature it can tolerate before dying? Penicillin candidum. Okay, as you say, penicillin candidum is a mold that we use to make camembert cheese. Okay, this is, we call it white mold. I would say, well, in case of penicillin, but we have many types of, of penicillin. We have penicillin candidum, we have penicillin roqueforti, we have penicillin as. Per helius, which is very hard to kill. 
But in case of penicillin candidum, this is a white mold. No, sorry. Uh, yeah, the white mold. Anyway, the temperature to killing is, is should be between 63 and 70 degrees. You can kill him in this in this um, range of temperature. However, sometimes they don't die, depending on the type of penicillin that you that you that you are having. So the best way to kill penicillin is by chemical sanitation. Bleach is the best option to kill it. Instead of boiling everything, because you, sometimes you have you, you might sterilize your equipment, but the, you have the penicillin on the air. It's floating on the air, and you don't know because you can't see it. So um, the best way to kill the penicillin is to sanitize everything or all your equipment. If you have the penicillin in your kitchen or in your plant, you have to sanitize walls, floor, ceiling, doors, everything. You have to use bleach. The bleach, the concentration that you have to use is one part of bleach, eight parts of water. Okay? This is the concentration that you have to use. Um, and you have to rub the walls with this. Of course, this solution is very, very strong. You have to use your mask, cover your eyes, your clothes, use gloves, because this concentration cannot be absorbed by your skin and you can have problems as well. Um, I use a lot of bleach. Sometimes this cough that I have is because of it, because sometimes I, sometimes I forget to put my gloves and I just clean with my hands. But it's very it's important that you use this type of of gear, protect, protect, protective gear, because you might have um, collateral problems when you are sanitizing with this type of of um, chemicals. So the best way to kill them is by chemical sanitation, okay, with bleach. Let's go with another one. Temperature, okay, temperature will kill him, but you're not sure. With chemical sanitation, you're gonna be sure that you're gonna kill it. Uh, another question. What wooden boards do you use to age your cheeses? If not wood, what are you using? Okay, look. If you're gonna make if you're gonna if you're going to age your cheeses for a long time, they uh, in in the small artisan plants they use timber. That's correct. But the, the bad thing with timber is that you have you have a lot of maintenance procedures because the timber, they I mean the all the old box uh, acros, they come into the fiber of the team of the timber and they're gonna put their eggs over there also into the cheeses. So um when you turn it over you're gonna have the bacteria into the cheese. So I don't like to use timber. As a matter of fact when we when we make cheese the bacteria the timber is not allowed for any reason. So if you're gonna have eight your cheeses put your cheeses into plastic or stainless steel shelf and Turn it because um, in this way you are guaranteeing that you're not going to have this cross contamination. However, when you are aging cheese, you're going to have a, a rind into the cheese, which is going to be dry. And this rind is going to protect the cheese. You're going to protect the inside of the cheese. So, in this case, if you are aging and you and the surface of your cheese is dry, you're not going to have problems you can use timber shelf but it depends on the type of cheese that you're gonna that you're gonna that you're going to ripen if you're making for example mozzarella and the mozzarella doesn't stretch because you haven't reached the high level the the, the the right level of of humidity because i think when we acidify mozzarella sometimes it's not always sometimes it get hydrophobic and this and you have to put it into the fridge or you have to let it ripen for three or four days or for a week to let it to hydrate so 
the proteolysis will allow the cheese to stretch eventually. In this case, you can use timber because you're going to contaminate the cheese. You have to use stainless steel or plastic. Okay, so um, it depends on the type of cheese that you make. Okay? Okay, let's go with the other one. Vacuum pack. Vacuum pack is better than cheese walks in. Well, I would say both ways of protecting the cheese are okay. There is a, I mean, this is the criteria of the cheese maker. Sometimes you can use both. The thing is that when you are making fresh cheeses, for example, or, or, or ripened cheeses or mold cheeses, cheeses that have mold on it, like monster, Camembert, like, um, let's say, let's say um, Roquefort, especially Roquefort, you can vacuum pack the cheese. Because in the case of Roquefort, the mold is going to be inside the cheese. But if you're making, for example, um, Camembert, where the mold is on the outside of the cheese, on the, on the rind, on the rind, on the rind of the cheese, if you vacuum pack your cheese, you're not going to have the development of the mold. So in this case, don't vacuum pack it. Um, if you're going to make a cheddar, which is, you have to, all, first you have to um, press the cheese, let it dry. So you, when you have a dry rind, when you run, when you run it's dry and you can, it's dry to, to, to touch. You can do both, both. You can wax it or vacuum pack it. You can do anything. I wax it. I like, when you vacuum pack it, the cheese doesn't breathe. If you wax it, if you wax it the cheese will breathe a little bit, okay? Um, I prefer waxing, but I also do both. If you're making fresh cheeses, when you're making fresh cheeses, for example, like mozzarella or fresh cheese, queso fresco. I would suggest don't wax it, vacuum pack it. Why? Because if you vacuum pack it, there's not going to be air inside. The cheese is not going to breathe. Therefore, your shelf life is going to be more extended. So it's going to be bigger. So if you want to extend your, your, your shelf life, vacuum pack your cheese. Don't cover it, don't wrap it up with film paper. Vacuum pack it because in this way, you're going to extend your shelf life. So it depends on the type of cheese that you're making. If you're making Parmigiano, Reggiano, Parmigiano, Reggiano, you don't have to wax it, you don't have to vacuum pack it. You just let it, let the ring dry it up and but it's dependent on the cheese. Uh, if you make manchego, manchego, you have you wax it. Normally, you wax the cheese. You don't vacuum pack it. You can do also both. You can um, wax the cheese and then vacuum pack it at the same time. Do both, and you're gonna have your you, uh, to 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 uh, especially when where the when the cheese is ready to eat, and you're not gonna eat it because for for a reason. Or you have you 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 want to extend the shelf life. <coughs> Remember the cheese when when is um, when we have the cheese. There is also a process of proteolysis. This pro and lipolysis. The longer the cheese, the better it tastes, and it also changes the texture within time. I mean, this this process is very slowly, especially when it's vac when it's um, age. When it's um, wax, when the cheese is wax, if you if you vacuum pack it, you're gonna slower this process even more. So you can do both, wax it and then vacuum pack it. Sometimes when we are, if we have a cheese that is ripened, and it, and the, even though the, the the rind is dry, if we vacuum pack it, the, the cheese tend to sweat a little bit after. I mean, talking about after years or after a month. It depends on the cheese that you pack. And this way that is into the bag, you're gonna you're gonna see the way into the into the into the 
bag and it's kind of disgusting. I try one, I remember when I was studying in the cheese school, I tried a pecorino which had eight years vacuum pack and it was all immersed in whey. It was really disgusting. I thought it was rotten, but when we try it, it was a beautiful cheese, perfect, fantastic flavor. So, but this is what happened when you vacuum pack it. If you would have, if you would have, oh, if, if, if the person that had the cheese would have put into wax, maybe the cheese would have breathed a little bit and we don't have, we, we wouldn't have this problem. And, but anyway, um, all will depend on the criteria of the, as a cheese maker. Okay. Okay. Um, I reckon we have two more questions and we go. Can you please advise how to mix 30% calcium chloride solution? Ah, this is a very easy one. Not only calcium chloride solution, you can prepare also brine. And I'm going to tell you the how to make, how to achieve the concentration. Remember that the density of water is one, one kilo per liter. Okay? So, if we want to make, let's say, 30% solution of calcium chloride, First of all, and this is very important that you need to know, your, your salt, which is your calcium, your calcium chloride in powder, needs to have a concentration of 99%. It has to be almost pure. Okay, 99.99%. 99 is all right. Or 99, but normally when you buy this product, they are, you have to ask for the concentration. If they are, for example, 70% pure, you're going to have 30% of on pure product. Impurity, I don't know, I don't know, call, I, I really don't know the term in English. But anyway, um, if, you, if you get your salt, which is 70% pure, you're going to have 30% of impurity, which is not good. So your numbers are not going to work. And this 30% of impurity might be dangerous for your for your for your solution so the best case scenario is to have a 99.9 percent .9 product purity so if your solution is 30 percent which is normally the, sol the solution that you used for calcium chloride you have to use to prepare 100 milliliters you have to use 30 grams okay so you what you need to do is weigh the 30 grams into a scale, weigh 30 grams, put into a container, okay? You have, first of all, you have to tear your scale. You have to weigh only the product, not the product with the container because the container also weighs. So you have to tear your container first empty, okay? Put in zero, put in zero your scale, put the dust or the powder, boom, put it inside, weigh until 30 grams and grab this 30 grams Put it, put it into a, into a container that you can measure the, and reach it until you get 100 milliliters. Okay, once you get your 100 milliliters, just stir everything, dissolve the calcium chloride, and you're gonna have 100 milliliters of calcium chloride at 30% solution. Very easy. The same with the brine. If you're going to prepare a brine at 20%, weight 200 grams, of brine, sorry, 20 grams of brine, okay? Sorry, weigh 20 grams of salt, 20 grams of salt, and put it into 100 milliliters of water. Dissolve it, and you're gonna have 100 milliliters of brine, 20% concentration. If you're going to prepare bigger amounts, like two liters, three liters, you have to go linear. You make it like, like a conversion. For 20 liters, sorry, for 100 milliliters, I have 20 grams. For two liters, how many grams do I have to put? And make the conversion. And reach the amount, if you're gonna prepare two liters, you have to fill the, your container until two liters, okay? And if it is two liters, it would be 400 grams. If you're gonna prepare Brian 20% solution. So you have to wait 400 grams and raise, put into a, into a bowl container or whatever and raise the, the, the water 
up to two liters. Stir everything. The same happened with the calcium chloride. Okay? This is the way how to prepare it. And this is the way how, do I, how I prepare it. Okay. And, and the last question, Laura. Uh, when making cheese, Laura Craig, when making cheese and the recipe state whole milk, does it include with cream? Well, look, Laura, when you make cheese and the recipe tells you a one gallon or two gallons of whole milk, this milk is in general 3.4% fat, more or less, in average. If you want to make a double cream cheese, you have to add fat, additional fat of the fat that the milk already had. So in this case, we call this process standardization. So you have to standardize your milk. But this is another story. This is another topic that I'm gonna teach you after, okay? In, in, another, in another class. Um, generally, your milk has 3.4% fat and you don't have to add any, you don't have to add anything. It, it includes the fat already. When you say whole milk, you already have the fat, which is more or less 3.4%, 3.5, 3.4, no more than that. Okay. So when you are making cheese, read the fat content of your container. Remember, use pasteurized milk, non-homogenized milk. This is the best milk to make cheese. You recognize your milk because when, when, when it is non-homogenized, because you have a layer of cream on the top. Um, if it doesn't have this layer of cream, your cream, your cheese, uh, your milk um, could be homogenized, which is not good for cheese making. I'm not saying that it's not good, but you have to use calcium chloride and things get a little bit more complicated when you use homogenized milk. So if you want, if you're just learning, make cheese with Pasteurized, non-homogenized milk. You're gonna have any problem. You can make any type of cheese. You can make pasta filata cheeses, mozzarella, provolone, um, any type of South American cheeses, fresh cheeses, Oaxaca cheese, queso de mano, Venezuelan queso de mano. I mean, you can make any type of cheese. Okay. And, and well, we're gonna say goodbye. But before we say goodbye, Manal has another question. What is the kind? of calcium chloride long life for powder or solution? What is the kind of calcium chloride long life? What do you mean by long life? Powder or solution? Ah, I see. What is the best way to have the calcium chloride? The best way to have the calcium chloride is in powder. Of course, you have to keep it in a dry container. Keep it dry because you can have more amount. But if you have it in liquid, doesn't matter. You can also have it. The thing is that you're, because you have the water on it, you're going to have to have, a, if you want to, if for example, if you want to store three liters of calcium chloride, you're going to need a, a three liters container. But you can have one kilo of calcium chloride and prepare the solution as long as you need it. This is what I do. I have one or two kilos. I have my calcium chloride powder, 99.9% .9 concentration, which is almost pure. And when I need it, I just grab what I, what I need, dissolve it, boom, put, put into the into the milk. This is what I do. And this is what I just suggest, what I suggest you to do. Okay? Uh, well, thanks for coming. Um, as always, just spread the voice that I'm here every week. I would like to have more people. I will for sure um, make the program every week, even though we don't have anyone, doesn't matter. I will make the program because uh, I want to people learn how to make cheese. Um, of course, if you come to the program, you're going to be able to get your questions answered for me. Otherwise, you're going to have to wait until the, I, I am available. Sometimes I try to answer questions um, during the, in, in my channel, but I'm trying to, to channel all my questions through this program. So if you want to have your, your cheese questions answered,
come to my program and you will have it for sure. Uh, so, um, thanks for coming. And as I always finish my programs, ah, by the way, um, go to my YouTube channel. If you want to have the message that I say every time that I finish my program, which is eat cheese because life without cheese is like a love without a kiss. <laughs> which is the message that I always say when I um, finish my program. You can buy the, 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 the shirt. It's very fancy. I'm just waiting for mine. I'm going to have it as well. And, well, as I said, eat cheese because life without cheese is like a hug without a kiss. <laughs> See you next week, okay? So you're invited again. Bye.